Don't be shy, come in front. There is still room in front. You can move around. You will not be stuck here for a week. Only until lunch, isn't it? Until lunch. Huh? So people come in, there is a, just a, one announcement I forgot to tell. An announcement. Woohoo. Every minute you're late is a minute less of lunch. Come on, come, guys, come, let's come, go. Come, 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 come. Um, so people, we are starting now. So all the chit chat and chatting is over. Coffee break is over. I will give an announcement. It has actually been, remember when we had the, um, the calling out for countries, ministries to raise? Sorry. Sorry, it has started. Hello. It's an important announcement because what we were not aware, we were aware, but we forgot. It's a big fire in, uh, in the city. Uh, not dangerous. It's only a warehouse, but they have been fighting with the fire since yesterday. And that's the reason why many of us, of you guys, were not here in the morning because they were stuck in the tram. So don't take the tram. It will have maybe be a couple of days without a tram, but the Tebana, the tube, the metro will work fine. So it's not a problem. I just wanted to, um, to say that, uh, remember we were asking for Ghana Health Service and Ministry of Health in Ghana, and they were not here. They were stuck in a tram. So please Ghana Health Service race. Woo! Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. So now we all know that we are not uh, uh, going to the tram, only the, the metro. So over to Austin. Thank you, Kristen. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I think Ulo wanted me to mention that if you can move a little bit in so that people that are coming in late don't have to climb over the top of you to get into their seats, that would be, that would be helpful. So move a little bit away from the, the inside edge, at least. Um, that would be great. All right, so who wants to talk about DHS2? Anybody interested? Woo, nice. I like the enthusiasm. We're going to talk about the latest features and releases in DHS2 versions 39 and 40. Those came out in November and May, respectively. Uh, and there's a lot that we're going to have to go over, so we're going to have to move pretty quickly. We're also going to try something a little bit different this time with some role play and, and theater. So um, if, we met, if, we, if we mess that up, please uh, apologize. I apologize in advance. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Austin McGee. I'm the technical lead for DHS2, relatively new position for me, but excited to be here and share with you a bit about what we've been working on this past year. I'm not going to talk that much because I'm going to turn it over to uh, many of my colleagues who are going to dive into the details and, and share more about uh, what's, what's new in DHS2 in the last year. Okay, so first off, what have, what have we done? Uh, what has happened since the annual conference in 2022? We've had two major releases, as I mentioned, version 39 and 40. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's the kind of enthusiasm I like, thank you. <laughs> um, we, along with that, we also had two releases of the Android capture application. So that was version 2.7 and 2.8. And in addition to that, we, we kind of highlight the new features that come out with the major releases of DHS2. But we've also been doing a lot of other work behind the scenes. So probably many of you have seen uh, the patch releases that are to all the supported versions of DHS2 to add a few minor features and mostly fix bugs and issues uh, and make sure that it's as stable and as, as reliable as possible. We've also had a number of hot fixes to address critical issues in a very timely manner. So we have 
hot fixes for supported releases about every two months. But if there's something that needs to come out quicker than that or needs to come out across all the versions at the same time, we release a hot fix. So that might be a security issue. It might be a critical performance issue, something like that. So this is, again, trying to address and get out there as quickly as possible the most stable, reliable version of DHS2 that we can. I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we've been doing behind the scenes. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, or a lot about the different features that are in DHS2, but there's a lot that's going on uh, to, to make that happen and to make DHS2 better in, in more subtle ways. So this is uh, an effort that we have ongoing for uh, improving the design and usability of DHS2. So we have a new team that joined us um, at the beginning of last year in 2022, uh, doing functional analysis and functional design. And we're expanding the design team as well and working with some partners to, to really improve the usability of DHS2 as a product, which in the end leads to better data and better use of data in pro programs that actually matter. So there's a lot of steps that go into design, right? So. We've got talking to users, we've got exploring how they actually interact with DHIS2, um, testing how they, uh, how they use the software and how they understand it from a, a training perspective as well. And then using that to inform how we build DHIS2 software. We've started, as, I saw, as you saw previously, uh, focused primarily on the Android capture application, which is typically the, the um, last mile user of DHIS2, but this is going to, to spill over into all areas of the product. So that includes the data entry on the web, it includes the uh, way you manage and configure DHIS2, as well as how you analyze data. Another important important thing that's going on kind of behind the scenes uh, in the last year is the move to continuous release. And this is something that's been ongoing for a little while, but what it means is that the core releases, so those two major releases we came out with in the last year, are just a, a, a small piece of the puzzle because those are now decoupled from each of the applications that we have. This means that every application in DHIS2 can be independently released by the core, core team at UIO, also can be uh, custom applications built by anyone in the community that can be deployed through the App Hub. And we can release those independently and also support multiple versions of DHIS2 core with a version of that uh, application. So this avoids the risk of uh, needing to upgrade your entire server just to address a small issue or a small improvement to the user interface, because you can update an application independently and very quickly roll that back without a lot of risk. It allows us to release features and bugs, uh, bug fixes more quickly. So we don't need to wait until the next major release to do some of those uh, improvements and get those into the wild. And it allows for us to have also shorter interaction, uh, sort of iterations, apologies, uh, and user feedback, which feeds into that design process to better improve the software overall. So you can already find a lot of these applications that the team at UIO develops, um, as well as those that are built by the community on the App Hub and in the App Management app on DHIS2. And many of the features that we are going to talk about here today that are in 39 or 40 are also available for 38, or if they were introduced in 40, are, are already available in version 39 because they're just updates to the application and that application happens to support 38, 39, and 40, for example. Some things because they have requirement, but for any feature that doesn't have that requirement, we're able to quickly introduce that uh, way that works across different supported to. This is a pretty exciting uh, step change and it's been a long time coming, but we're getting to the point where the majority of our applications are actually on this new uh, mechanism for delivery. Thank you. I, I, uh, I'll buy you lunch later. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I did mention also that that is available for not only the applications that are released by the UIO team, but also for applications that are released from the community. So we've had the ability to install and extend DHS2 with web applications for quite some time. Um, and all of the, basically we're eating our own dog food, as they say, which means that we are using the tools that we build for the community for our own releases. I also wanted to highlight one last thing about the version 40 release, and this is our beta testing program. So this is something that uh, was introduced in 39, I believe, um, but it really took off in the 40 release cycle. We worked with seven, I think it was more than seven in the end, with different organizations to do extensive testing of version 40 before it was even released. So more than 11,000 tests were performed by these organizations on realistic databases that they're actually using in production. So they were upgrading to version 40 and testing all of the functionality one at a time. We had a pretty impressive uh, pass rate and 96% is not 100%, but that means that the other issues, so all that 4% of issues that might've had something that wasn't exactly as it uh, um, was expected to be, uh, were followed up and the critical issues were fixed and those that were, weren't as critical are fixed in the future uh, patch releases of those that version 40. So really excited to see this uh, take off in version 40 and hopefully it will uh, manifest in a very stable and um, uh, smooth upgrade process for everyone once you upgrade to version 40. And we're hoping to continue and expand this in the future as well. So I wanted to, to thank a few people who were involved with this. There were quite a, quite a number of people. Um, first of all, the, the QA team at UIO, so the, the DHS2 QA team, and Phil in particular um, has really been the champion of this. So huge thank you to Phil for putting this all together and the rest of the team as well for, for really making that, um, making that possible. Phil's right there so everybody can, can, can look at him. <laughs> uh, and then we also, of, of course, I want to thank our beta testing partners who were involved in this and um, spent spent their time to make sure that we're testing each of the features and functionalities within DHS2 very rigorously with production databases and, and real use cases. Um, and a special thanks to a couple contributors from HISP uh, Sri Lanka who, in addition to doing tests and, and being a part of the beta testing process, helped us to improve it and really had some good, uh, good feedback and input on how we can improve that process and make sure that it's, it's, it's fully covering all of the functionality in DHIS2. So with that, that's all, that's all the behind the scenes stuff. Now we get to the pretty pictures. Um, we're gonna go through the different product streams within DHIS2 one at a time. Uh, and we're gonna introduce, uh, the product managers are each going to introduce the features that are in version 39 and version 40. We're not necessarily gonna split them out and say this is in 39 and this is in 40. You can go to the release notes to figure that out, but you'll see what's new in the last year of DHIS2 development. And I hope that you enjoy what you see. Uh, we'll finish with, uh, as I said, a little bit of that theater um, to, to show how these features kind of work together in a, in a pseudo realistic situation um, to make a DHS2 system serve the, the needs of a, a real um, implementation or real, real use case. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marta Vila, uh, my colleague from the Android team to talk about the functionality that's in the Android Capture app, versions 2.7 and 2.8. Hello? Yes. Salif Zuhman here, if you prefer. Thank you, Austin. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Marta Vila, the Android or mobile product manager. I'm pleased and honored to present one year more the work that the Android team has been doing. So this, um, the difference with the demo means that we are gonna go through our features without demo now. So we hope it's not very heavy. Um, we have kept it light. And, but if there are doubts or things that are not clear, please join us in the, um, in the what's the name? Expert launches that we have tomorrow and uh, Wednesday at 5 p.m. If you have questions about this, it's not only for doubts or anything. It's just to discuss the products. 
So let's start with Android. Um, in these last two versions, we have mainly focused in user experience and implementation support, but we have also done some functional parity. We have new Android web apps, and we have an exciting use case data flow that I will explain later. And the first one is the real-time stock management module, which is for LMIS. So for user experience, uh, the data sets in the last two versions have had a real big change. So what the, I mean, the layout seems different, but the main functionalities that we have been requested for so long is to resize the columns. So you can do that now easily by, with a drag and drop. The tables also render the color that you select when you configure the data set. You can use legends and the scrolling when the table is big up and down and sidewise, it has been improved as well. And the data entry, do I have a mouse? Yes. So the data entry form keeps the context uh, for the user. This little field is new from 2.7. So moving on to the sync process was also one of the, the processes or parts of the app that we got uh, more requests. So we have improved the sync process, mainly the first one. Most of you using the app know that the first sync, closer. Okay. Uh, so most of you that have used the app know that the first thing is the one when we download all the metadata and all the data. So it's a bit slow sometimes. The time that it uses now is the same, but we have tried to make it more dynamic by opening the home screen right after the app knows the metadata. And then when the, the data is loading, we are informing the user what's, what's happening, which, which program is actually being uh, download, it's downloading the data. And the full thing will happen only the first time. So not every time you open the app. That's a big improvement for, for Brian as a community health worker. <laughs> uh, the other thing that we have improved here and we, are, we hope it really helps, this is very new, is the contextual sync error feedback, which is this little uh, dialogue here. So now we had already messages for it errors that were adapted to the context, but what is new now is that the user can navigate from whenever, whatever screen in the app it is to the actual error in the form to fix it by only tapping on top of the, of the error when it's on the screen. So you can go from the home screen or the program screen down to the form and you have the field highlighted, like this is the field that is wrong. So we really hope this helps navigating the, the sync errors. So moving on, uh, we have new renderings for tracker and data entry. First one, uh, the digital signature. You can now collect a signature for consent or however your configuration needs it using the, the mobile phone. This is stored as an image. So it's the value type image and it has a specific rendering type. And then we have added a few actionable buttons for three uh, value types. So the email, the phone number, and the URL value types will, not, will now be actionable. So if the user taps in the phone, for example, it will go to the phone app in the device and, and let you call that patient, for example. Same for the email and same for the, if you have URLs. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, another rendering improvements is that we have extended the rendering types for the option sets. The option sets, I don't know if this is widely used, but you can decide the rendering of your option sets. It can be a radio button, it can be a checkbox in horizontal or in vertical. And if you assign icons to your options, it can also be visual data entry and your icons will be rendered there. So this worked only for text before option sets with value type text, you can use them now for any value type that you are using on your option set. So we hope this helps making data entry a bit more intuitive for the users. There are many other fixes that we have been doing. We have increased the tappable areas in the icons and in buttons. We have added loading banners in the process that were reported that were taking some time so that the user doesn't feel that the app is frozen. We have improved the offline user experience by either removing the options or informing the user that this option doesn't work because you don't have internet. We have improved the display of long texts in some places of the app, and then the navigation of the sections that now have this next button here because the accordion was not really intuitive 
we are looking at this uh, as part of the design project. So hopefully we'll improve it even more. But for now, we hope this next button helps uh, the user know what to do when they reach the last data element. So that's all about user experience. Moving on about moving now on about functional parity, mainly with tracker. We have two main aspects that were we were a bit behind. Well, one that we were behind, which is the file value type. The file value type was not supported in the app. It is supported now in the app uh, for tracker and for data sets. Um, yeah, th there is a maximum that you can configure for download. So we will make sure we don't download very heavy files from the server when you sync. You can set that up in the Android settings web app. And then the working list with data elements, this were not, we were not uh, behind. It's been released together in Android and, and Tracker. So Mike will present this later. But just to say, it will go together where the working list already were. And the Android user, the community health worker, or last mile user is not supposed to create the working list for now. They will be configured on the server and then the app will download them and offer them as a filter. So now about the web apps that are two new web apps and one of them is APK distribution. I'm gonna explain you this one right away. The other one is use case configuration. I will explain that one at the end of the, the presentation. And this is part of uh, was, what Austin was presenting. You just have to go to the app, to the app hub and app, manage, app management app and then app hub and find them and install them on your server. So the app APK distribution web app we are very excited to see how this is adopted because this has been highly requested. We are trying to offer functionalities that normally will be provided by an MDM uh, software, but we know that most or some implement, most implementations don't have it. So what we are trying to do with this is, uh, is obviously part of the effort for supporting implementation from an admin perspective. So what the APK, so what this app uh, is doing is to let the admin control the app, uh, the update of versions of the apps in their own instance. So you choose which version you want uh, your users to have, and they will have auto update, but from the version that you say here, you decide when to update an app, an, a version here and not Google Play. So if you, yay. And uh, and uh, thank you. That was really <laughs> spontaneous. Um, so yeah, we we are very excited to see how this takes um, into the field and and how can we expand this MDM-ish uh, functionalities. More on implementation support. We have removed the limit of offline accounts. Uh, we had a limit of three before. There is no limit now. We are worried about memories in the devices, but that's on you now. Uh, <laughs> so we hope that helps. It was it was really requested from the community. And then it, there was another request that is not fancy, but uh, but it was apparently a bit painful, which is that the, the Android settings web app required an all authority. So that is not the case anymore. It has its own authority now. So those of you that requested it, I hope you are happy. We think this is gonna make a difference as well. And then moving on, uh, because I'm taking a bit long, this is the second web app, is the use case configuration web app. We are also very excited about this one. Let's see if I manage to explain it properly. What this web app is letting you have a specific app module for your use case. A module is something that lets you configure your program and parameters to have a different data entry flow and user experience. So, for example, if you have configured uh, your program, let's say, uh, this is not a real example, but if you have configured your logistics program to use the specific UI developed for it, and I will show you a real example right now, when the user, it's, it's totally integrated in the app, but when the user opens that program that you have set in the server, this uses the this specific data entry flow and user experience, it will open a different screen like this one here, this is real, but you don't lose the rest of the functionality of the app for the other uh, programs. So if you have data sets, if you have programs that use the regular user interface that we all know, they are all here. It's integrated as well as the analytics. So we think this is contributing to 
the functional extensibility right now is really tied into the application. But we hope in next versions, this can be more dynamic and more open to uh, external use cases that are developed in the community. So this is the real example. Is the real-time stock management module developed um, together with the LMIS team and his Pseudigitus? And what it does is that it allows for real-time stock management of health products at facility level. It has. Yes. There is a lot of work in this module, I have to say. So, so it, it has the barcode scanner up there. So the functionalities that it uses from the HIS2 are the same, but the way the data entry flow works and the and the this and the UI is designed is totally different for the use case of stock control. So it allows for barcode scanner. The actions are distribution, discard, and correction of workflow. It has the offline uh, capability because it's on top of the app. So it uses the SDK and everything that was built in. And it allows for possible real-time integration with, uh, with ELMIS. So this is not going to be demo today. So I really invite you to join the LMIS session later today at 1 p.m. in Auditorium 4. Is it correct? I hope. Yes, if not, check uh, the app. There will be also a stand in the bazaar later. I'm sure if you visit them for that, you will get very good cookies, George. <laughs> They're delicious. And then there, there will be also in the expert launch uh, both the days. So please, if you are thinking or in, of interested in, in logistics at the facility level, join, join those sessions for a proper demo and a proper explanation of the use case. And this is my last, my last slide, Mike, over to you to present Tracker. I think I'll try out this microphone. Is this one okay? Yeah. And based on all the chatter, it sounded to me like uh, Breno and George, you'll see a lot of participation from the logistics side. So yeah, nice. So I'm Mike Frost, the product manager for we always say tracker, but actually it's all the individual level data that this team works on, whether it's the events or longitudinal data and tracker. And, and actually where most of this is uh, functionality is now is within the Capture app. And so I'll, I'll talk to you a bit about that. Just to say that during this time period, 39 and 40, we've had dramatically increased scale for the, the implementations for individual data. Um, this is showing a, a slide I think that we've shared before, but this has become more and more the norm in, in a lot of countries. So not only are there 75 plus uh, government owned systems, but they are hitting this very large national scale with millions and millions of people being registered, uh, 40, 50,000 users. And what we've had to focus on a lot is making sure that the, the database can handle it and that the performance is something that will encourage use and would not lead to uh, all of the, the kind of offline or ad hoc data collection. So just, uh, I, I know there's always more to go, but we have been doing a lot to try to get the system to be able to handle this kind of load. There's been huge improvements to program indicators, for example, in terms of performance, particularly in 240. You'll continue to see more and more of uh, these kind of performance improvements, uh, which we hope is a good motivation for upgrading and for moving on to the more recent versions of the, the Capture app uh, and, and of DHS2. So talking a little bit about this, those of you that have been around for a while know that the Tracker Capture app is quite old and uh, has been something that's with us in our hearts for a long time. But we, we have rebuilt it uh, entirely in the, the Capture app. We have almost full parity between the two at this point. And this will be the, the first time that I'm really urging you to move on. Let, let it go. Let it go. So just to give you one sense of a reason why the we've been able to, to redesign the Capture app from the ground up, meaning that we got to have a lot of time focusing on usability, the way that we've been talking about before. I'm not going to go into every detail of that, but I wanted to show you just from the, the very simple uh, enrollment screen here, there's it on first glance, they look similar, but there's actually so many changes in this to improve 
for the user who is doesn't have to be a DHS2 expert. They're probably somebody very busy. We know that they're entering a lot of data, trying to make it as easy as possible. So adding in little tool tips that tell them the context of what they're doing. They're saving a person in a child program in Ngelehun or putting a, a loading uh, button to show that the system actually is doing something when they hit save person. We're adding, uh, removing all of that context on the left and being able to put the full trail up on the top, adding more contextual information that gets pulled from your labels, your configuration that would tell them it's a person, it's a new person in program child, pulling from your tracked entity type. So there's really quite a lot of effort that's going into usability, trying to make it uh, a much more intuitive product. Actually, many of you in this room contribute to that. We have weekly meetings where we go through use cases, we talk through user scenarios, we present back designs. These designs are being taken to the countries where we work often and being tested out. So a lot more effort going into this, and we hope that that means that it will end up being something that you're really happy to switch to from the Tracker Capture app. Uh, giving you a sense of some of the things that are in there that aren't just feature parity, but actually completely new. Having something like an enrollment dashboard where you could see the different uh, stages all at a glance, the previous events, be able to interact with them individually, but maintaining context over on the side that would give information about this person or this tract entity with the appropriate indicators, their profile. So a, a lot, a kind of a landing page that gives a lot more of the context and overview. Um, improving the enrollment uh, widget, giving the information not only of where they were enrolled, but where the they started this program, who currently owns the program, when it was last updated. So a lot of information that can be contextually very useful, improvements in scheduling and how that works. We've had for quite some time requests to, to make it, again, much more of a dedicated service to be able to go and to schedule uh, an event and not bury that in, in some kind of menu. So we've pulled that out. It has its own specific landing page. So I'll, I'll leave aside the usability stuff just to say we also invite you to continue to participate with us on usability. There's many times that we'll ask uh, if we can bring and test out new functionality with you, with your users. If that's something that's of interest to, to your programs, let us know because we're always looking for new scenarios. So then moving on to talk a little bit about working lists. Um, the first thing I want to do is, is back up a little bit about what the working list is. This is meant not as analytics. This is a tool for the person using uh, Capture to have a list of what, what things they want. What, how do they need to group these things based on what scenarios that matches their work processes? So this is a, it's a, a commonly used term in, in, in various clinical management systems. They want to find the specific people or the specific items they need to follow up with. And being able to give them these kinds of tools is going to really improve their experience for the data capture, data use. So just to show you some of the examples of these features, you can, for example, make a specific list and assign tasks. They can be assigned uh, to yourself as a user, perhaps you're a manager and you wanna see which tasks are assigned to which user. So being able to allow the, the assignation of these tasks. Um, of course, it's flexible in terms of what you decide to include in the list, picking from the, the various columns, which ones you actually want to show, what information to provide. And then crucially in the latest release, being able to add in data. So having not just the attributes and, and that contextual information, but actually data from specific program stages. And so you can see, for example, a working list here where the, the clinical user wanted to see all of the, the children of low birth weight because they're, they have a specific action that they're trying to follow up with these groups. You can pull up the data element for low birth weight, put in the range that is accepted for that and have generated from your data, the list of infants to be able to follow up with. These of course can be saved as a specific view and that's what we are encouraging uh, you as the program owner or configurer to do, set up some specific working lists for the tasks that that user is going to have saving it so that it's then available for them to easily click a button and get the, the specific list of, of tracked entities or people that they need. So I'll move on from working with this. Ownership analytics uh, is something that has been troubling us, I think, for a long time, especially those of us uh, working on the HIV side of things. 
very challenging. I know there's a lot going on here. Don't worry too much. This is really just to show you a single person, of course, can be enrolled at one clinic and receive services elsewhere. And that can happen as just a referral where kind of the ownership of that person remains at the original org unit. But it can also be a transfer. And it can be that from then on, they start to receive services at a new site, a new clinic that's opened or that they've moved, et cetera. And so what we've worked with is to be able to, to include uh, the ability in program indicators to capture this kind of dynamic change, right? So you make the choices based on the indicators you're trying to calculate, what level of context you needed. Did you need to know where they were enrolled, where they were registered, what currently is the owning org unit, or what was the owning org unit back in the past in the time period that you are doing the analytics? So this is a big step forward for us. We hope actually to do even a bit more with this when it comes to the analytics apps. But as of now, you can be doing this in your program indicators directly and you'll have a very easy just drop down menu showing you how to, to choose the analytics context that you want. Um, one more word about continuously released. I put this up here so that you could get a glance at what we mean when we say continuous release. This is uh, the versions that have come out since June 1st of the Capture app, meaning that we in the app are able to constantly be adding in required features, uh, required changes, updates, fix. And in the app hub, it would tell you, for example, update to latest version, and it will tell you which version that is. It has very easily that you can uninstall the version that you have. And again, crucially for us, we know upgrade processes are very challenging. They can be technically very difficult, politically very difficult, and you don't need to update the back end uh, to, in order to upgrade this app. And in fact, we've done everything we can to make the newest features compatible backwards to 238, which is when the Capture app was, was really coming out. Meaning that right now, if you're, you're not able to get up to 240 in order to take advantage of it, most of the new features you can get through the Capture app through an update. Pressing that button is kind of instantaneous. It's a very quick and easy, painless process. That doesn't mean you don't ever upgrade again. In fact, there are a number of things that won't be able to work uh, if you're installing and hoping to get, for example, uh, the, the program indicator changes for ownership analytics. You would need to upgrade the whole thing. But, but a lot of the kind of user experience, usability features, things that can change the look and feel of the app, those are available backwards compatible. So you can have the latest version of Capture even if you're on several versions back in, in terms of the, the back end. The last thing I want to throw up here was a, a big thanks to our implementation team that's been working on the design guide for the, the individual data for Tracker. This is something we haven't had uh, for years and years. You've all been just uh, making your own approaches to this, which is great. But we finally have some very detailed information uh, about uh, what considerations there are when you're setting up your program and giving you recommendations about the best way to structure them. So with that, I will finish up. Good morning, everyone. I'll try to use this mic. Uh, my name's David Kennedy. I've just come on board as the new platform product manager. Um, I'd like to introduce all of the features that have come onto platform for last year. I haven't been here for the whole year. So if we go into a little bit more detail, so if you want a little bit more detail, please come and find me and I'll point you to someone that, that can explain it a bit better. We're diving into a big one here. We have a brand new data entry app for aggregate data. Um, this has been released now on a brand new technology stack. The old app was about 10 years old, so it was time for an upgrade. Um, we're currently running both the existing old data entry app and the new one um, at the moment. And what we will do is we'll be adding more and more features to the new app, and then slowly, hopefully, people will move across before we can retire the old app. So don't panic if you're very entrenched in, in the way that you're doing the aggregate data entry. The, new, uh, the old one will be around for a while. There's some great new features into the, the new version. As you can see, similar to the new Capture app, the, the top bar has the full context, which will stay with you as you scroll down so that you can see which org unit, which um, period, which data set you're do doing, so you can you maintain the contact context. Um, this one's also been very well uh, received. We've got an org unit data filter. 
So if you're browsing the org units and the data set has not been assigned to that specific uh, org unit, it will show up with a little um, cross there. So you can't select an org unit that doesn't have the data set attached to it. Um, we've added some extra uh, details to, on the side. You can see the minimax limits, the history and the audit log without having to, to change or go into a different screen. So you can scroll through and see that extra information as you, as you go. And you can also see the validation also on the sidebar there without having to switch context. All right. There's also a lot of improvements to the offline data sync. This was something that we had a lot of requests for. Um, there's a lot behind the scenes here that I will not try to explain how it works. If you do want a more, ex more detailed explanation, um, I'll find someone that can explain it better. All right. A little bit of a shift. We've got now um, multiple org unit geometries. What this means is that for each org unit, you can have not just the point location for the, say where that facility is, but also the capture area. So you can have a, uh, an area and a point location or multiple capture areas for different, different uses um, to be displayed in the maps. And then there's also a crosscut app, which will allow you to generate those capture areas. So if you don't have the uh, GeoJSON files, you can go and generate them with CrossCut and upload them to the, to the org unit. We also have a cool feature that is integrated with the Google Earth Engine. Now this allows you to automatically load an org unit uh, geography to the Google Earth Engine and bring in, bring in the population data. So if you don't have good population data already in the system, you can use this service to actually bring that in, use it as a denominator for indicators and analytics. <laughs> so here's a little screenshot of how that works. You can select the org units, link it up, and bring in that population data. And here's a preview. You can preview before you load it, so you can sense check, make sure it, it looks correct before loading it in. This is one that we expect to be quite popular. There's a new multi-select for the text box in the data entry. So, <laughs> yeah. so this is a very, very requested feature. We're happy to say that it's available now. One screenshot here, as you can see, rather than just one choice, you can have multiple colors, red, blue, green, just red, just blue. You can clear a filter. Um, there's lots and lots of ways that I'm sure that people will love to use this. Moving to a little bit more superficial, not so technical. New app icons. <laughs> everyone, yeah, everyone might be used to the old ones, but the new ones, there's there's uh, references to the old ones. You'll be able to see some familiarity, but now there's some consistency. It looks a bit easier, hopefully aid the navigation flicking through um, all of the different apps. The apps haven't changed. So if you upgrade and you see that the icons have changed, don't stress that all the apps have changed. We're just changing the icons at this point. Uh, here's another big one the aggregate data exchange service and app, we'll have a look at it. This is really, really powerful new feature. This allows you to either transfer um, aggregate data from one instance to another or within the same instance. So this allows you to take tracker data and put it into an aggregate um, form or actually upgrade, up, upload data to a different instance. So if you, for example, wanted to take uh, tracker data for uh, COVID uh, vaccinations delivered for a certain age group and put that into one um, aggregate value to upload to an HMIS, you can do that through this service. Um, the, it runs at the moment as a service and through the API. Uh, there is a web app that we are also, will be in continuous improvement. So at the moment it's there, but we'll be adding a lot more features um, very soon. Here's a couple of screenshots of how that works in the web app. Um, and this will, the configuration will be improved uh, a lot over the next coming years. We also have improved data integrity checks, lots of these. Um, these are really powerful to help the data instance managers find out what the data quality issues might be within their instance. There's 25 at the moment. We are gonna keep adding more and more. So this allows them to run really quick checks to see where there might be issues with the data and go and find them and fix them. Um, so you can see here the interface, lots of different uh, choices. And again, the more and more choices will come to help people clean up the data. 
moving along to job sequencing. So this is again a bit more back end, um, but it will allow people to bunch jobs into either parallel or sequential um, sections so that you can run a whole series of jobs. If you need to run analytics before you do something else, you can now sequence it, set it all off and not have to run each job and wait for it to finish before starting the next one. The, this is a big, exciting one for a lot of people. The API for DHS2 has gotten very, very big, very, very extensive. Uh, and that means that it can be hard to find the right place in the API for, the, for what you're looking for. So now the open API 3 specifications are available, uh, which means that you can download the entire API and use a browser like Stoplight to go through and see what all the, um, the functions are, be able to navigate certain sections. So you, if you want to just look at one part of the API, not the whole thing, you can look at focusing on that one section. So hopefully this allows developers to um, browse the API faster, find out more information, make more ex extensible apps. Um, this is another one that's, that's quite technical, but will be very, very exciting for, for people that have been waiting for it. Um, this is event hooks, which means that you can set something up to listen for a change in the system without having to go back and check frequently whether that, that um, item has changed. At the moment, it's available for the metadata and schedule scheduler um, features, but this will be coming more and more. We'll be moving this to meta users and, and data itself. So this means you can set up an, an event hook to listen uh, for, for example, when the analytics is, has finished running and then have an activity either in the cons a console, webhook, uh, Artemis or Kafka. And there might be more targets coming soon as well. Um, so this is a preview in 40. So that means that it is fully featured, but only for a couple of uh, metadata elements and we'll be expanding that soon. This is another kind of more technical one that might be very exciting for people that have been waiting for it. This root API uh, means that you can now access external services that through the DHS2 server, where you store the credentials on the server and you don't have to have that external service exposed to the public internet anymore. So this allows you to be a little bit more secure, allows you to access more external services without worrying about um, exposing them to the internet and has a lot of uh, expandability options. So I think that's me done. I'd like to pass over to Scott. Okay, best for last. Um, I'm Scott, I'm the Analytics Product Manager. I'll also respond to Mike or, Aust or by Austin as well. Everybody gets us confused. David shaved his beard off, so I think that's probably clear who David is. Um, before I get into it, I just want to say that I am not going to talk about maps. And the reason I'm not talking about maps is because there is a mountain of new incredible functionality in the Maps app, and it deserves its own plenary session, which will be tomorrow morning. So tomorrow morning, we're going to do all maps, um, and, and you're going to be able to see a lot of the uh, incredible things that have come. But don't worry, we have lots of other fantastic analytics apps, and I'll go through those now. So just jumping straight into it, a very long requested functionality is now the ability to add custom calculations in the data visualizer application. So what does this mean? This means that you're a district health officer and your system admin never answers their emails or they don't listen to you and you need a new indicator, right? So instead of just doing it in Excel, now you can just make it, make it yourself in DHIS2. And you can actually see that once you make the new calculation, it's tied to the data dimension. So that means it shows up just like other indicators or data elements. It can be applied to any different chart type that you have in the data visualizer application. Um, and it will be saved to this particular um, chart. But even better, it actually can be saved and you can reuse it in other chart types. So a few uh, important things to remember here. It does not create a new indicator. So for all of you sys admins out there who are kind of like, oh crap, now they're gonna make a ton of new indicators. It doesn't make a new indicator. Don't worry, you still have control over that. But what it allows them to do is create what they, we call a calculation that is saved in DHIS2 and also able to be pulled in um, to other charts, other uh, analytics that are made in the data visualizer application. 
So you still have your you still have your key, your key population or key impact indicators, um, and those are run by sysadmins. But you can, as a user now, make your own calculations that you can use in multiple charts, maps. Um, well, not maps, but multiple charts as well. Um, it can be applied to any chart type. So not just pivot tables, but bar, column, pie, whatever you want. And of course, it will show up on your dashboard once you, once you put it in. Okay. I am very happy to announce that all of the analytics apps, well, nearly all of the analytics apps are on the App Hub. So just as the others have mentioned, we'll be able to make continuous improvements and releases to these apps. So some bug fixes, some small new functionality. Of course, if there's something that requires a back-end change, then we'll have to wait to the next release. But if it's a front-end issue, we can hopefully continuously release that and make it available to you. We have also, in the line listing app, added legends. Um, so you're able to now apply a legend to your line list. So it looks something like this. And one fun fact about this ticket is, or this functionality is, this was actually the oldest ticket that, or oldest functionality request that we had still in DHIS2. It was made back in 2016 by Lars. Uh, if you're familiar with our ticketing system, it was DHIS-75. And for context, we are now at DHIS 15,000 something. So, so the moral of the story is don't give up. <laughs> we will. <laughs> don't be discouraged. Of course, of course, we had to build a whole new application to add this functionality to it, but we did eventually get there. So uh, keep hanging in. Okay, you're also able to add the scheduled date to the line list app. So what does this mean? This means that you can look at um, persons who were scheduled for appointments last week but didn't show up. You can look at persons who are scheduled for appointments next week or next month, and you can show those in the line listing app. And I'm also very happy to announce that the line listing is available now on dashboards in version 38, 39, and 40. Pause for applause. Yeah. <laughs> I know, uh, I know a lot of folks were, um, were getting a little impatient. I appreciate your patience. Uh, and I'm happy to say that now you, you can have all of your line lists on your dashboards. An additional functionality is the ability to add a legend and an icon to the single value chart types. So you can see an example here. Um, and, and, you know, just like all the other products, we're, going, we're constantly going through a process of improving the user experience, making the data come more alive, uh, make it more available, easy, more easily interpretable. And so we understand that adding these icons and then just changing the entire background color uh, hopefully makes it pretty obvious in terms of performance and exactly what the indicator is measuring. The icon, of course, is selected through the um, icon library in the maintenance app, configuring the data element or the indicator. We have to talk a little bit about performance. We are continuously making performance improvements and investigating performance issues. And I want to sincerely thank all of those who come to us with performance issues. Although we are doing much more rigorous testing, you all are using DHIS2 in many different ways that we can never test for in different contexts, scenarios, scales, whatever. And, um, and there will be performance issues that you might run into that there's just no way for us to necessarily know about uh, giving our test environments or our testing team. Uh, and over the last year, you've been communicating these to us, or at least quite a few of you have been, and we've been trying to make continuous improvements to the analytics performance. So I'm also happy to say that analytics queries are about 25 to 40% faster, over 2.35, and we're able to now generate our uh, analytics tables about 40% faster. But continue to please communicate to us, and number one rule is don't suffer in silence. If you run into analytics problems, do reach out. And I think that is it from me. So now... Thank you, Scott. All right, now we get to do the, the fun part of the evening, uh, morning, whatever, wherever we are. <laughs> it all blends together these days, huh? Um, okay, so we've just heard a lot of very cool features. Can we have one more round of applause for all of everybody that went into, everything that went into making those? I think that was also record time for how quickly we got through all of those features that were released in the last year. I think we skipped 
quite a few as well. So definitely look at the release notes and, and the webinars, which go into a bit more detail about what, uh, what we have introduced in each of the releases. So this next uh, section is gonna be, gonna be a little bit interesting because we're actually going to have a little bit of role play. Um, we have a few, make sure I'm here. We have a few actors in this, this little uh, scenario for you. Um, Brian, uh, my colleague from the implementation support team at UIO is going to be playing an outreach nurse. Um, we have Vittoria who's going to be playing a district health officer and I will be the omniscient narrator slash DHS2 system administrator. <laughs> I will do my best to, uh, to stay in character, but I might, I might uh, contextualize things a little bit for you as well. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to just weave together a few of the features that you saw here in, uh, introduced in DHS2 version 39 and version 40. And we're going to uh, show you how, how those work together in a pseudo realistic situation or scenario. So in order to do that, I got to switch the screen here. I believe I'm doing this correctly. Yes, it's a little bit blurry perhaps, but you should be able to see my screen here now. So as your uh, omniscient system administrator, I am going to uh, be doing a little bit of configuration to get us set up. I'm not actually gonna be configuring the system, but I'll do some, some apps to install some applications to get the latest versions of the software. Uh, and then we'll uh, go to our correspondent in the field, um, who is the, the outreach nurse, Brian, and that'll be in just a couple of minutes. But to start us off, I'm going to go ahead and install a couple applications that have been uh, continuously released in DHIS2. So to do that, I'm gonna go to the app management application. As we saw earlier, this is where you can see a lot of different um, apps and the new versions that are available. So as soon as they're published or released, it shows up on my screen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, as soon as it, uh, as soon as a, a version of an application is released, it'll show up here in the app management application. You can update your applications independently. Uh, we'll get back to core apps here in a minute um, to do some updates there. But first, uh, I'm going to start with what Scott just introduced, which is this line listing application. So you'll see, I actually already have this installed, but you can see. Uh, the list here, all of the versions that have been released of the line listing application. Uh, and you can go ahead and install it into your system to get that uh, functionality. And as, as Scott mentioned, this is available from 238, 239, and 240. Uh, so this same version of the application with all the latest features, maybe some that are turned on and off based on the version of the server you're talking to are available there. So I've already got, uh, installed this one. Uh, I would click a button here to, to do that. Uh, I'm actually gonna uh, demo that. So I just uninstalled it. Now you can see that I don't have a version installed here and I'm gonna click the install button to install the latest version. It takes just a couple seconds and there we go. We have the line listing application installed into our DHIS2 instance. There's one more application that I'd like to install here as well. Um, I actually already have this one installed as well, um, but you can see that this is the APK distribution application. So I'll do uh, that one in just a moment. Um, and the last thing is a very cool feature that Scott just uh, mentioned, which is putting line lists onto the dashboard app. In order to have this functionality, we need to have the latest version of the dashboard app. So here in the core apps section of the app management app, you can see the, the versions of or the, the applications that are built into DHIS2 that have updates available. So there's obviously a dashboard application already in this DHIS2 version 40 instance, but I can actually go here and we'll see that this one just was released on continuous release last week, June 6th. With, with this version. So this is after the 40.0.0 release, and there is a new version available that I can go ahead and install. So if I click install here, I'll get the latest version of the dashboard application, which allows me to include line listing application, line lists on my dashboard. And with that, I think we're all set up. I did wanna show here also quickly, uh, we're not gonna use this for the demo, but I could also uh, update the version of the Android capture application. So you'll see that I already have a version installed here in my system. 
uh, that is version 100.32.8. Uh, the version numbers are, are continually increasing and each, each application has different version numbers. So usually you just wanna go to the latest one, but you can go ahead and install that latest one if you wanted to. You can keep it on a slightly older version if you wanted to keep some of the, um, the if some, something changed that you didn't like in the interface for that, for some reason, uh, you can stay on an older version as well. So I wanted to show that in the capture app, which is also on continuous release and has been for quite some time. Okay, so with that, I think I'm going to switch over to my colleague Brian, who's actually not in the in the um, call here today. So I'm going to see if I can get him on the phone. See if we can call him in here. Let's see. Go ahead and give him a ring. Brian, are you there? Oh. Hi, can you hear me now? It's Brian. Outreach nerd, and I'm going to install my DHIS2 application. Um, this is actually my not my first time uh, putting it on, but I'm uh, just going to log in here really quickly. And while I'm logging in, I'm just going to be waiting for the authentication to happen. And yes, I actually do want to help improve this app. This is something that everyone should be doing. And you can send some notifications about it, syncing configuration. And uh, while I'm doing that, just thinking about what I have to do today, some other things. This is a big part of uh, being an outreach nurse is just waiting. <laughs> but as I sync my configuration, I can also um, I can also plan out my route for the day and where I'm going to be going. Um, so this will be first. My configuration is ready. But I also see that I have a software update that's uh, available to download right now. So I'm going to download the software update. And I'll say, yes, please, uh, please allow from this source. And then I will go back. Will in the background of the application, it will be, uh, yes, I will, oh, problem parsing this one, that's fine. So uh, I'm just going to open up the child program here. And then I'm going to see who I have to find today. So I'm going to open up my, my filter here. I'm going to go to my visits today. And I'm gonna see here that I have Joelle and Martin that I need to go visit. So when I go back to my, my list here, I can see that there's also a maps icon at the bottom. So I'm going to just quickly uh, check out this map. And yes, I will allow location while using this app. And I can see as I zoom in here that actually, they're both pretty close by to me. So who do I have here? I have Joelle and I have Maria and Martin. So first I'm just going to uh, select Martin here. And then I'm going to say, oh, I want to go find how to find Martin. So I'm going to open up the maps application here. And while it finds Martin, it's also going to give me directions for how to find where this house is located. So I'm gonna ask it to give me uh, directions in Google Maps for how to get there. And it turns out they're pretty close by because they're just in the auditorium over here. So we're just to walk over here. Usually I have my bicycle for this part, but not today. Hey. Was there a Martin here? You look like Martin. Okay. Well, I'm gonna ask you some questions about your baby now. I hope you don't mind with this uh, live studio audience and everything. So I'm just going to click on Martin's name in the card here. And now we'll go through the baby postnatal visits. So I'll enter in the report date. Um, how fat is your baby? Uh, what kind of fat? In grams, like. Um, 780. 785. Yeah, metric system is tough. Huh? Um, breastfeeding? Um, no. No, no breastfeeding. Okay. Yeah. Uh, replacement. Okay. Um, measles? No. No, no, no measles. Uh, but you've received a dose for it, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. No anti vaxxers here. We're good with that. Um, <laughs> yellow fever dose, also good. I'm going to give you a vitamin A supplement. Yep. Uh, childhood ARVs. Nope. Not, not for us right now. I'm actually really happy to tell you, Martin, that uh, we have uh, your HIV test results for your child. I hope. Yeah, that, that it comes from the PCR and they are negative. 
Hey. Yeah, so I'm just going to ask you to add your signature right there, if you could. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. <All> right. <laughs> You're an artist. <laughs> so we're just going to save that up there. And now just save the event. And that's uh, the last visit I had today. So thank you, Martin slash Vlad. <laughs> Now, that's not the last thing that I had to do today. That was my last outreach visit because now I'm going to plan my subsequent day and the next work that I have to do. So um, I'm going to swap over to the Capture app. Can, oops, whoops. Can you see the screen here? Might take a while. Yep. So in the Capture app, I'm actually going to already have this uh, child program and my registration unit up here. And you can see the list of all of the different uh, registered um, patients here and the child program that I have to follow up and see. But I have a, a custom working list here for just children who are low birth weight in a supplemental feeding program. So that could not be loaded for right now. Um, so I will also, maybe it's because, ah, there we are. It's always clear cash or not logged in. So I'm just going to go back to the capture app. Oops. Capture. And then again, choose a child program, Meglahoon CHC, and click low birth weight. So now we can see that um, it's pre-selected for me. The date of enrollment is in the last uh, three months or last 90 days, uh, the program stage was at birth and the weight was less than 2,500 and it had a uh, mixer replacement uh, feeding in the child health program. So now I can see that these are individual uh, children that I should be following up with tomorrow. Um, but it's not the, the last job that I have to do. Uh, my work is not complete until it's all documented. So uh, a part of my job as well is that um, I have to find my uh, facility tally sheet uh, for mortality and statistics. So I'm just going to enter into the data entry app here. Fortunately, these are all the children under five. And say month that it occurred. So at one case, acute classic paralysis. Uh, no rabies, no cholera, uh, some malaria, measles, meningitis, no plague, thankfully, uh, and some no rabies, typhus, et cetera, et cetera. So once I enter in all of these here, uh, yellow fever one, once I enter this, then I can um, run validation and see what the alerts are, that there's a high number of yellow fever and meningitis cases here. Um, but then I will also mark it complete. And that's my day for today. So hopefully someone will give me good feedback on the data that I have uh, collected and we can improve our health programs from here. Thank you, Nurse Brian. Now we're back uh, at the system administration level. So I'm, I'm pulling that up now. Hopefully we can get it on the screen. Okay, great. So we were, we were just here. Um, I forgot to demonstrate the actual uploading of the application to install the version. So I uh, am omniscient, but I don't, uh, uh, I do get impatient and, and skip some things sometimes. So I will, <laughs> will demonstrate uh, just here quickly that you have a version of the Android capture application that you can upload uh, in this APK distribution app. And so this will allow you to specify the versions of the Android application that the users in your system will get notified about, uh, which is a, a very uh, a useful feature, I think. Uh, we saw the, the uh, update notification that um, Brian got when he was out in the field. So the last thing I'm going to demonstrate here as well is uh, the uh, data exchange application. 
So we just saw some data come in through a tracker program, which is individual level data. Um, but sometimes you want to aggregate that and put it into the aggregate data model, either within this DHIS2 instance itself. So moving it from a program indicator or a program data in the program to a, um, a number in the aggregate data model. Uh, or potentially to send it to an external system. Maybe you have a tracker system and you want to set to aggregate your tracker data and send it to the HMIS. This is something that can now be done using the data exchange service and the data exchange application. So I actually have already configured one of these um, uh, exchanges. And here I can see what data will be sent or will be aggregated. So this is taking tracker data and it's sending it to an aggregate data element. Um, I have the, the number of OKV3 doses given in uh, each of the chiefdoms in, the, um, uh, in Sierra Leone in this case. Um, so you can actually go through and review all of this data manually. Um, you can also schedule this so that uh, I could schedule this so that it would run nightly, for example, or run after um, maybe maybe once a month, I want to send my tracker data to HMIS or to uh, a, um, another repository somewhere. And once I've reviewed this and made sure that it's okay, um, I'm going to click submit. So it asks me to confirm what data I'm submitting. Again, in this case, we're doing an internal data exchange. So we're actually aggregating the tracker data within this DHS2 system and putting it into the data elements uh, in the aggregate model within the same system. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and it's going to submit and it will show that in this case, uh, this data was already created, but I've updated all of those data values for the aggregation of the individual level data over the last 12 months. And that's now in the aggregate data model. And I can use all of my visualization tools. Uh, I can correlate that with other data in my HMIS uh, without needing to query the individual level data directly using a program indicator, for example. Now we're gonna go back to uh, someone who's doing a little bit of analytics on this system. So with that, I would like to introduce our district health officer, Vito, to come up on to her office and, and demonstrate a little bit uh, how to use the data that we've collected in the field and how to um, use that uh, at the district or the national level. Vito. Yeah, no, Brian, yeah, no, fantastic job, but um, I heard you, you, what are you doing in, uh, in, in surgery? Um, what do you mean they lost the register? Um, no, 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 it's, it's okay, it's okay, Look, just, just try to find it. Um, yeah, no, no, I, is it it? No, don't, don't pass it, no, Brian, 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 no, don't pass him, Brian, no, no. Brian, Brian, you're fine. Yay! Hi, no, it's fantastic. Fantastic to hear from you. No, lovely. Um, yeah, no, every day I check. Yes, yes, every they enter weekly. Yes, I check every day to check that they don't enter more often, actually. Yes, yes, um, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, no, we're doing great, actually. Yeah, 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 I I'll keep you updated. Thank you, thank you, cheers. I have not entered or checked data in months, probably. Um, sure. Oh, okay. So, thankfully, I actually like follow a little bit what my admin tells me. Um, but let's check a little bit. Yeah, that's actually. Let Let's follow what admin says. Um, okay. So I have here my data that I had done a while ago. Um, it's not found, that's fantastic. Oh, there you go, there you go. Okay, so I had to check some some immunization data because that's supposed to be my job normally. Um, um, I forgot my glasses, but it's okay. Uh, actually, I forgot my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my glasses are there because the demo is gonna. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. So I have my OPV because we're doing great apparently. So I have some deaths here and I've heard that they were doing already some calculations. So I might add it there. But unfortunately, they told me that I don't have anything on coverage. So just, just very quickly. Oh, the pressure. Uh, how do you do it? Um, I think I have to have OPV data. So that one. I know, but wait. And then, of course, for coverage, I need a population under five. There you go. There you go. That's a good one. And then times 100. And then I call it, let me check the formula because you never know. All right. Um, and then OPV3 coverage. Okay. And I save it. And then I update it as well. So, yeah, I should have everything there. So, how do we even have high coverage that we have children? We need to find out. But uh, doing great, doing great, not doing amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, just just let me quickly check what's going on here. Um, so let me remove that. Let me remove that. And um, I think we should go down there. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Um, let's do quarters since it's been a while, haven't you? Actually, not fairness. Um, okay, and let me check if I can do something like that because I've heard that I can actually, I can actually change it. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't work like that. No. Mm. There you go, there you go. And I heard that I can actually change and do it properly. All right. We're not doing amazing, but we can get there. Um, better than last year, though, nonetheless. Um, okay, we might have a problem here. Okay, just let me save it a little second. Okay, let me go here. Got to love when they change all the icons. Um, okay, so we're doing great here. Um, okay, so actually something that I have to thank admin again, remind me later, the line list, because I knew that something was dodgy here. Ah, oh, there you go, there you go. And then uh, the OPV3 coverage. Oh, do you want me? Mm. There you go, I can't find it as usual. Oh, whatever. I'm gonna tell Brian to add it. Um, okay, so I'm actually going to call Brian just a second because it looks like we have some work to do. Brian, so yeah, yeah, I already told you to get out of there. Um, what do you mean they lost the surgeon now? No, no, get out, get out. Oh, we need to like schedule some more visits. Just get out of there already. We need to talk. Thank you very much to Vito and Brian, our two actors today. Big round of applause. We had a volunteer from the audience as well, who was a, a very proud father. <laughs> and I wanna say thank you also to Marta Vila and Grant, who did a great job putting all of this together. It was a little bit last minute, but we're, we're excited to try something, try something a little bit different to, to weave the different features together. So thank you to Marta and Grant.
And with that, I think we are done for the morning and we are moving on to lunch. So is there a, an announcement before we move to lunch? Thank you everyone for your attention and for joining us on this journey through DHS2. So we we're going we're going across the across the courtyard here to lunch. So follow follow some of your helpful UIO staff who I'm sure are going to be leading the way, um, and bring your badge. You you don't get to eat unless you have a badge. So make sure you bring your badge, um, and there'll be instructions waiting for you on the other side. Thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.